Hello, I'm Jewel from the Singapore Art Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session, A Date with Sam, Chiu Hao Pei. This program is organized by the Singapore Art Museum and is part of our exhibition, Lonely Vectors Seeding Sovereignty, which is currently showing at Bedok Regional Library. This evening, I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker, artist Chu Hao Pei, and moderating the session this evening, we have curator at the Singapore Art Museum, Joella. Thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thanks so much, Jewel. And good evening to everyone who is here again today. Um, my name is Joella and I'm an assistant curator at the Singapore Art Museum. Before we jumped into this um, evening's conversation proper, I thought I'd give a brief introduction to Hao Pei and his practice. Hao Pei is no stranger to us here at the Singapore Art Museum. He was one of our three pilot artists for our Artists in Residence program and most recently presented some work as part of our residency showcase, Present Realms, which we will also have some photographs of later. Hao Pei is a visual artist whose works are primarily influenced by his long-standing interests in the interrelations between culture and the environment. His practice explores the shifting physical, sociological, and emotional connections with our natural and urban landscapes. Throughout the course of this evening's conversation, we'll be focusing primarily on Halpe's latest work, Seeding Sovereignty. The work takes the form of a seed library and is designed to build on shared knowledge, affirm our mutual dependence, and reimagine different ways of organizing ourselves. It emerges from the artist's long-term interest in rice and its circulation within Singapore and Southeast Asia. As Joel mentioned previously, the work is currently cited at Badok Public Library, and Seeding Sovereignty is a work that was commissioned with the public library's location in mind. It will later travel to Amokyo Public Library, Jurong Regional Library, and Tampanese Regional Library. Seeding Sovereignty is part of a larger multi-site exhibition that we're putting on here at SAM. Titled Lonely Vectors, the exhibition takes its cue from Sam's new space at the Tanjong Paga District Park as a site of the global economy and its choreography of movements. Beyond the library's location, Lonely Vectors has also unfolded across the hoardings that now wrap around our Brass Basa Road and Queen Street buildings. The final movement of Lonely Vectors will open in June 2022 at Tanjong Paga District Park. Now that I've gotten some of that context out of the way, Haupe, I think it'd be great to open up our conversation with an eye towards your long-term research and interest in rice. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how it began. Yeah, thank you, Joella. Uh, and thank you, Sam, for hosting this. Uh, good evening to everyone and thank you for attending this talk. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd like to also share a little bit of what I have been uh, working on actually since pretty much since 2019 as well. But maybe also before that, I would like to run you through some of the images of the current um, current exhibition right now. So as you can see here, this is the, the layout, the kind of how the seating sovereignty is currently uh, presented in the Bedok li uh, Regional Library. Uh, so over here, you what you are seeing is you are seeing uh, quite a quite a number of um, some scarecrows and then there are some some custom made cabinets and then also some banners as well uh, uh, next yeah yeah so over here um i am also kind of um re repurposing a lot of this um materials that i've actually salvaged from from different uh different places and also different individuals who i you know in my own network uh, my own uh, freaking network actually who actually helped me to source a lot of these items uh, but more importantly is like uh, also why am i what am i trying to present here in exactly is also what i'm looking at is uh, in this form uh, as you can see some of the um some of the uh, what you call it, the, the the words they are written there. Um, for example, the one on the right it says um, "rice for people, not for profit," and also on the left uh, there's this uh, white on white, which is a little bit not clear. It says "no seat dictatorship." So for me, I'm also I'm really trying to look at the idea of importance of seeds. You see, because uh, a lot of times we talk about um, farmers growing a pe uh, peasant struggle, but we do see a lot of such protests happening around the world, uh, but yet we don't really know the exact um, reason behind uh, all this. And a lot of this got to do with how certain, uh, a lot of the seats are being um, arrested by uh, these big corporations in that sense. And, and so a lot of these farmers actually have these struggles actually. Uh, next, yeah. So uh, in, in this presentation also, I um, not only am I just presenting a read, 
reimagining the site of, of farmer struggles as well. Uh, it's also, I'm also distributing at the same time as well, I'm also using the site as, as a, the site of a library as a way of distribution of uh, knowledge as well. So what, what, what best is, uh, can I do in this form is therefore I wanted to create a seed library as well. And so here, what you're seeing is that uh, on the right, I have literally different packets of uh, rice, pack, uh, rice seeds, uh, which will be distributed, which are free for all to take, for all the uh, participants to take as well, to go back and, and go and plant them. And inside there are actually some uh, uh, rice growing instructions, rice plant growing instructions to guide the people to grow them. And as you might notice on the left uh, slide, is also when you open it, it's also, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, there are some information, kind of like information panels, and all of this is also got to do with my own uh, research, de uh, my departure point as, as a research based practice as well. So, a lot of this different information comes from uh, different, different books that I've read, different literature that I've read, and they are very, very um, anecdotal, uh, but yet I always find them uh, very important and very. Uh, uh, interesting to, to kind of know what is behind this common grain that we are, you know, at least in this region where we are consuming. So it, it gives it a lot of context and, you know, this idea of uh, the rice is not just purely something that we eat almost every day, but really it has a lot more layers, uh, be it in terms of spiritual, be it in terms of cultural, also in terms of political terms as well. Yeah, yeah so. thanks so much for sharing all of that. I think that's such a good overview, I suppose, of not mm. just um, your interest, but this particular work. And I know, you know, you touched on this briefly. I think we all, everybody here mm. attending this um, talk would have some kind of relationship to rice. Um, personally, we might eat it on an almost daily basis, or we might know a bit from a dietary perspective. But I wanted to ask a question that might maybe seem a little bit obvious, but I was hoping you would shed some light on this as well. And that would be, why rice? Like, you know, there are so many different crops mm. that are, you know, um, specific to the region as well. Mm. Um, what about rice kind of drew you into that whole mm. entire history and, yeah, looking mm. into it? Uh, well, yeah, so I guess this uh, has to go back to uh, the starting point of how I kind of get into this whole project. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, uh, so back in 2019, three years ago, I was actually doing uh, an artist residency uh, at uh, Yogyakarta, Indonesia, uh, under the National Arts Council and Chermati Institute, uh, Institute for Society and Art, uh, where I was doing the, the residency there. And to, cut, to bring it briefly, I was uh, working very closely with uh, this particular uh, young, young farmers group called Sekolah Tani Muda, which directly translates as a young farmer school. So um, my, my starting point with looking at rice is actually, I started off trying to look at uh, trying to look at the the kind of the spiritual and uh, spiritual part, part first. So and and I guess this is something that got me interested in a sense whereby um, because in Indonesia there is also uh, they do have a deities uh, so, uh, specifically for rice uh, by the name of Dewi Sri and also in 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 uh, some areas also also known as box Sri as well. And so that was my starting point. I started to look at that. Uh, but interestingly, as I worked with this farmers group, uh, this young farmers group, um, Sekolah Tani Muda, they did share a lot of different things as well. And slowly I, I was involved with them in some activities to understand what this is. And one of the first things that they did was really they started um, kind of packing all these different seeds. Of course, it's not just rice seeds, but there were also uh, corn seeds, there were also kangkong seeds and a lot more other different seeds because their point over there was really, um, they wanted to distribute the seeds kind of in relation to to say counter the uh, a national bill that at the point of time where the government Indonesian government was trying to uh, make owning seeds uh, an illegal act itself. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So we packed the seeds. You know, I joined them and we started distributing them to the different people because for us we all believe that you know um uh. It, it, in, in terms of the a form of resistance is really true to really grow them because who, in a way, uh, farmers have been owning seeds for generations. And then today we have a lot of um, sovereign state in the sense that the government comes in and start detecting and uh, usually influenced by big corporations to start telling us that, um, oh, you know, this seeds is patented, you cannot own them anymore. And this is a very large global issue. So, so with them, I was working quite closely with them to, to talk about this and to bring back a bit to the early point about the spiritual side, which is also interesting because eventually a lot of this uh, 
uh, rice seeds that people are, farmers are growing these days are no longer the native seeds that they are growing, but actually seeds that were distributed and sold by all these different corporations. And as a result, they also eventually lost touch with their spiritual and cultural uh, connection where they uh, actually no longer even, some of them, they no longer even worship uh, these deities as well. So there's also a eroding of, of um, cultural and spiritual sense in a way. And I think one interesting case study was that um, one particular farmers we were kind of I was uh, interviewing as well was saying, oh why uh, why bother uh, worshiping Dewi Sri, which is the the rice deity, and say because the, the rice seeds that we're growing today are no longer the rice seeds we used to grow maybe say one generation ago. So yeah, even if we worship uh, her, she will not recognize the rice seeds anymore. So this becomes a very uh, uh, spotlight if, uh, thing that I realized that you know the idea of seed is so important in that sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah, next, next slide here. Okay. Yeah. But I also think that you know I think how you were talking about this tussle or this tension between I suppose you know this um, perhaps um, more cultural or indigenous way of life as compared to you know um, the ways in which corporations come in to maybe um, have a copyright or a patent on particular seeds and on particular varieties as well. There are a lot of historical factors that go into how, you know, this is shaped and social cultural factors as to why that is the case. But I think maybe to pair that back to perhaps what many of us might be familiar with in the context of seed saving and seed keeping, we might have heard often of, you know, seed banks, for example, mm -hmm. which are places and vaults where seeds of uh, many varieties are kept for, I guess, a doomsday situation or circumstance so that they can be drawn out again if necessary to grow um, in the respective places um, in the event that, you know, there's a, some kind of climate emergency or some kind of change in environment. But I think the way that you're approaching this is quite different in the sense that you wanted to respond to the library site as itself. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit about, I guess, your kind of impressions or like um, of the library and why that was something that you found um, an interesting or generative point to be thinking about seed distribution? Mm. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you bring up a very interesting point, you know, the idea of seed bank itself. Uh, of course, so to, to to start on that, I think seed bank, uh, as we know, uh, is usually uh, run by states or run by a larger corporations with a lot of resources. And they are probably often the one dictating also what types of seeds uh, should come in as well. Uh, however, it is also something that I work very, uh, something that I learned from uh, while working closely with um, this young farmers group, the Sakura Tani Muda back in Yogyakarta, is that, um, they, they did mention, and I think it's something that resonates with a lot of farmers, is that the way of, the best way to preserve seeds is actually to grow them. Yes, seed bank serves as a, as a way to, um, say, say preserve them, maybe in a, in a very dry area, so that, you know, it really, any natural disasters or war happen. Uh, I mean, we've seen a number of documentaries kind of showcasing that. But for, for me, I, I want to see in, in a different way, whereby uh, the best way to preserve seeds is really to start growing them. And by growing them, it also not only just preserves the seeds, but I'm also kind of disseminating knowledge as well. And uh, of course, this knowledge um, is not something that uh, I, I am directing, directing whoever is picking up these different rice seeds packets in, in the installation that I'm distributing. Uh, but also at the same time, it's, it's really more of, it was just a guidance, it's more like a, uh, like a guide where people have to kind of figure out on their own how they really learn to, 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 to grow them as well. Because I guess in the context of Singapore, most of us, uh, yeah, most of us probably do not have that expertise of experience in growing rice. And, and this is also the, the point, this is also this uncertainty that I like, that I want people to really go and explore itself because that was something that I, uh, there's basically an uncharted waters that I went into myself and I kind of uh, unraveled this, this, um, this Pandora's box, you can say it that way. And, and it really brings me to a lot of interesting things, you know, from, from realizing that, oh, you know, rice is not just purely a, a staple food that we eat, but there's so many layers to it. And I guess in this case, in terms of seed distribution also, it's also the idea of, um, uh, I can say a kind of, countering the kind of status quo and also countering that that very system that that often dictate us you see and i always certainly believe that you know 
the way to, to bring forward is always the, uh, um, the commons have to be involved in, in doing this. And it's not always just state initiator. It has to be from a bottom up perspective. This is something that I find very, very uh, strong in, in, in during my time in Yogyakarta. And, and not just Yogyakarta, but pretty much in a lot of very peasant led uh, communities that is often very bottom up and this is something I, I thought it would be interesting to to push uh, to push and in this case um, perhaps by starting to distribute seeds itself the rice seeds itself for people to grow yeah, yeah. maybe if I could trouble um, Jewel to move back to the slide where we had mm. an image of the seed packets that are being given out um, at Badog mm. um, yeah this slide would be great I think something that I guess was very interesting for me to hear also, um, and whilst we were working on this, for me to learn was, I suppose this movement away from, you know, a top-down system where you are given a couple of seeds to grow, but really just this, I guess, circularity or this kind of horizontality also that you're thinking of with this particular um, distribution system. I was wanting to maybe get a sense of why partic why um, you know, this idea of interaction or engagement was something that we wanted to include within the work um, because the work already functions as a library with the sort of materials and historical anecdotes that you place at the bottom of it. So for those who might not have seen the work in real life yet, the individual cabinets and uh, individual drawers have um, information um, that Halpe has collected from all of his research into rice and this can be, you know, quotes from books historical information, but also some of these spiritual kind of practices that he was talking about earlier as well. And as you pull open the various drawers, um, you will be able to kind of learn a little bit more about rice and its histories in the way perhaps we would draw out information and knowledge from the library. But a, an additional layer has been added onto it with this idea of seed distribution as well. And I was wondering how if you could expand on that a little bit more and why that was such an important part of this particular work. Yeah, so um, yeah, the, the seed distribution part for me is really a very crucial component in this work. In fact, uh, whatever people are seeing in, in, in the library itself currently, uh, I, I would say is perhaps uh, only 50% complete because the other 50% comes from uh, the participants who actually take that, those rice seeds and actually start growing them. Whatever context, whether past, whether they successfully grow them or fail, um, for me that is the idea of it. Because um, the the seed distribution is not just the idea of preserving uh, all these different um, na native rice seeds that are specifically identified to to uh, share it, and but also as a again coming back to the idea of a knowledge uh, knowledge passing moment as well. So all these are very. Um, the seed distribution is something I find very crucial to this whole work itself because uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's also very, perhaps I can say very didactic, also a very, perhaps you can also say a very top-down on a one-way uh, manner where I am, oh, you know, I found all these different information, quotes or, or historical facts and whatever not, and I'm showing them. But, you know, I, I don't want it to be such that it's just like, oh, I'm telling you what is, is this and then that's it, you see. But I also want... Uh, the audience to themselves participate in this work itself because I don't think the work is complete just by by people coming to see it and consume it and then that's it you see because the very important thing is also uh, by looking at all these different things what they understand that oh okay you know you realize that there are all these different issues and then perhaps they can also um, maybe in the Singapore context is that to relate themselves more towards what are the struggles of, of farmers you see I think this is something that um, you know, uh, since since the pandemic happened, you know, the, the state has also been distributing uh, different vegetable seeds to people to start growing them, encouraging uh, growing. Uh, that, that is something encouraging. However, I think for, for me here is not just, uh, for me, is the, the growing part is a process where I am looking at um, not just for the sake of growing, like self-sufficiency. That's not what I'm trying to achieve because uh, I, I don't think we can actually achieve that in Singapore. Uh, but then the idea is really to go through that process of, of growing them, to learn it as well. And, and more importantly is to also, you will realize that, you know, different, because there are different seeds as well. It's not just one type of seeds. Different seeds have different growing period and also different type of uh, grain profile. So you can also learn a lot from there and, and notice that. And it is a part of the process that I find that um, 
you know, it's, it's a kind of knowledge making or perhaps I can even say a kind of knowledge uh, empowerment by, by the audience itself. And for me, that is where the other 50% of the work is, is uh, that, that completes this work. Yeah. Yeah. I think it might be a good time for me to incorporate one of the questions that have just come in from the audience as well. Um, and I think this might also maybe tie into a larger kind of, um, I guess, description of the sort of seeds that you've included, the varieties of rice seeds that you've included in the library. But we do have a question about how seeds are patented um, and how perhaps what the legality of owning rice seeds are like here in Singapore. Mm, yeah. So I um yeah in, in relation to that question is um I think the issue of patenting seeds is something quite uh, big globally, not just Singapore, but I guess in Singapore we do not get so much uh, spotlight because uh, we are really not an agriculture uh, domin dominant country. So a lot of such things we will not we don't really talk about it. And uh, for me, no, I have I would say I've not gone into any trouble. But in terms of how seeds are patented, it's definitely coming from a very a uh, very capitalistic system where you know uh, corporations start buying in all these different seeds and uh, what they have been doing a lot of times is that they have been inventing uh, different type of seeds of course in the early in the 60s and 70s during the green revolution we all know there's this thing called the genetically modified uh, uh, seeds gmo seeds so these are these seeds were very controversial as well because they were artificially created but these days these type of seeds are already less um, less common, uh, although they are still patented, you know, um, the other type of seeds that are more common these days are hybrid seeds. So what a lot of people are doing, uh, scientists as well, uh, they are basically crossbreeding different type of uh, uh, varieties to create a more so-called superior variant or, or something that's more high yielding. Um, and, and in that case, that is where, you know, people start coming in uh, or rather, whoever is uh, researching on this are started coming in into patenting the seeds itself. So um, this is often the, the, uh, the point, I would say the, the space where it's also quite ambiguous because a lot of farmers have been contesting such things and saying that, you know, uh, seeds have been with us for generations and then now you take away a lot of our native seeds and then you are selling us the seeds itself and, and you call it patenting it. And, and this is where the struggle is, I would say, of the idea of um, the struggle of, of the, uh, these patented seeds as well, uh, which is why for me in, in this case, I over here, um, this is also the point where I am specifically distributing uh, as much as possible also this native, uh, native rice seeds as, as well, because these are seeds that are not under patents and they are actually, um, actually they are pretty uncommon or sometimes even rare to even find them. And, and I've gone through a lot of extensive efforts to, to source them as well. So um, uh, technically speaking, I, I, I don't think in Singapore it is illegal to, illegal to own your own seeds. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I, I think it's, it's also such a gray area or rather it's not in the spotlight and we don't really talk so much about it. Although, although of course there are certain seeds where uh, I think when you start to try to ask for the copyright and stuff, that's you know, where I really get into issues. But when you start growing them it's, uh, in large scale, that's where the issue of patents uh, come, gets you in a little bit of trouble, I would say. Yeah, I think maybe also it'd be a good time to talk a bit about the sort of instructions that um, you had accompanying the various seeds, because like you said, there are a lot of varieties of seeds that you have within the library, um, mostly native varieties. But because of that, um, you know, every, every seed has its own kind of peculiar characteristics, they have their own kind of personalities. So that means that I suppose they all grow at their own kind of rhythm and pace as well. Mm. Tell us a little bit more about, I mean, how was it like kind of doing up those rice growing instructions such that it would be, I suppose, um, instructive enough to kind of guide people along the process, whilst also maybe um, keeping it open-ended enough also so that there might be room for them to also feel things out on their own. Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess the instructions itself is also really uh, a, a space that I want the audience to explore themselves. Uh, although I know, I guess, a lot of times, um, uh, I think being someone who, who grew up in Singapore, we are so used to literally 
taking in like oh word for word instructions for, for a lot of things you know we don't really dare to um, experiment uh, a lot of things and push and try certain things and uh, and, and over here this is what I'm also trying to do with with the rice growing instructions itself uh, like I mentioned because different seeds have different growing period and some takes uh, some of them take longer to mature some some are faster and and so with that I so I basically gave a kind of a very rough period, a rough timeline of what the, the different seeds will, will take to, to, to grow. But I already indicated also some of the points where you, know, you can take note of them. And, and in that case, that's also where I want people to start um, learning them to grow it. Perhaps, perhaps um, a kind of a parallel analogy that I can talk about is uh, uh, the idea of recipe. You know, how, how of, um, often we, uh, I, I guess this is something universal, not just, uh, not just about farming. I think farming is very uh, unspecific to Singapore, but recipe-wise, it's something very specific. You know, uh, a lot of our family have kind of passed down recipes. We, all we have is only just, okay, we teach you how to do, we may, at most we write certain instructions and that's how it is. Eventually, it takes one to really kind of figure your way out, experiment a bit to, to learn that way. So in, in that way, I want... I also want that to be realized in this situation of, of growing the rice itself. I, I want that this, this knowledge, this knowledge of growing seeds, uh, growing this rice seeds to also come in the form of uh, embodied gesture. You know, the knowledge doesn't have to be just in the form of uh, theory or, or, or instructions. It, it also has to be uh, go into the idea of a muscle memory, you know, just keep doing it. By doing that, then you get the muscle memory and with that muscle memory, then you realize, oh, okay, this is how it is. And I think it's, it's something that we practice and something very similar to perhaps I can say cooking, which I think a lot of people can relate more to, you know, the more you practice cooking, the better you get at it. And, and in this case, it's also uh, what I'm trying to push. And I, I think the keyword, the keywords here I wanted to uh, talk about and push is really talking about um, the idea of uh, how knowledge passing from the seed itself uh, going into a very embodied gesture, which is in this case, planting them, growing them, uh, harvesting them as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, when we were working through the instructions, I also told you this reminds me a lot of like a recipe, right? Yeah. Um, and I think particularly because you are asking people also by way of these instructions to use their senses to, to get a feel of, you know, an understanding of, you know, not just visually what the plant, the seedling would need, but also in terms of, you know, touch and also in terms of, you know, just being very well attuned um, sensorially to, I guess, the needs and the desires of, you know, a growing sapling. And I was thinking, I mean, at this point, maybe it might be good to also bring in another one of the questions that we've mm. just gotten from the audience as well. Um, and this probably comes back to what you were talking about with regard to sourcing for seeds. I think we have a question with regard to what your process was like on that front. Mm. And maybe you can share a little bit more about, you know, um, how that came to be and how you gathered the amount of seeds necessary for this particular project. Mm. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so I, I guess this is the part where it is, we we'll say the, the most difficult process uh, in realizing in realizing this this um, uh, seeding sovereignty itself because the seeds are actually extremely extremely precious to, to farmers and in fact most of them are, are not um, not willing to actually share them without really fully trusting you it's, uh, without fully trusting you so and this is where I think. Um, I think for me, I've always, my process in terms of my art practice has always the idea of uh, uh, being involved, being, being uh, not only just involved, but also being there, there and there to be present with, with these different groups, you know, to share with them my, my sincerity, you know, my intentions as well, because uh, especially with in, in overseas, you know, the idea of seeds is very, very sensitive people would not anyhow share seeds i mean i've also gotten a lot of rejections from from people who are obviously who are not not familiar with what i'm doing and, and that's totally fine i can understand the starting point and how i kind of source them is really through my own uh, friends uh, network of friends in the region itself who i share with them you know this is what i'm trying to do i'm not um, you know, tr not trying to patent them or whatsoever. You know, the idea is about um, passing the seeds, passing that knowledge, you know, let people to grow themselves. The best is always the idea of um, 
um, to, to grow them in different spots because we also know, um, sorry, kind of bringing it a bit back to the idea of the library. Uh, we, we all know that, you know, a lot of times knowledge disappeared or a bit destroyed because libraries are often targeted to be destroyed, you see. But for me, I'm also thinking in a way about how do we kind of diversify this and, and through all these different people, you know, we can have different spots of preservation of these seeds. Uh, but more importantly is that the pro relational process is really uh, very much involving with them. And, and a lot of times I've also, um, uh, work with them on several projects as well. Um, uh, yeah, so so even self self funded projects as well to to really talk about a lot of different things and and it is all often the idea of the process because without the process then uh, a lot of this uh, that, like this entire body of work will not be realized it will not be possible as well because um, like I mentioned you know this work whatever you're seeing in, in the library itself is only 50%. The other 50% comes in the process of growing itself. So um, therefore, it's very often that my, um, how I approach, I even ask people for all these, can say sensitive uh, resources, uh, comes from uh, a very, very personal and a very um, sincere approach where I, I, obviously I gain the trust, uh, I gain their trust not overnight, and not only just a few months, but you know, over a long period of time as well. So uh, I, I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was, I think that really helped to, I guess, give an idea of, I guess, all the behind the scenes work that you have to do in order to kind of get to, you know, um, a place like this and also see a work like this, bring that to light as well. I think something that maybe we can also move to are the other elements within the work as well. Um, the work is, of course, you know, at the heart of it is this particular seed library. But as you've mentioned, it's also accompanied by a series of scarecrows. And that's also something that you has been a um, fixture, I suppose, mm -hmm. within, you know, a work that you also did at Substation, uh, which we are looking at here on the screen together. Yeah. Um, and I think very interestingly, um, we received a question from the audience, which I would love to actually get your thoughts on. Um, which would be with regard to, you know, your interest or your use of scarecrows within the installation. Yeah. Um, I think many of us are familiar with the fact that scarecrows are used to perhaps scare crows mm. away from, you know, the crops. Um, so to prevent, you know, I guess, um, pestilence or, you know, uh, eating of crops by, you know, various other animals and non-human beings. But mm. Do you see them as perhaps also protecting the rice or the seeds from predators besides birds? Mm -hmm. I I would say there's no uh, one way to read read the, the the scarecrow itself. For me, the scarecrow is uh, is a is is a very much a metaphor. Of course, um, like you already mentioned, you know, the idea of oh, the scarecrow is to scare the birds away, you know. Uh, but also at this, I mean, definitely there's this this element of of fear or scare in in uh, in them so um, it's something that I thought uh, that can play a part in kind of so-called um, like oh scaring them like being a protector of, of all these seeds but also at the same time uh, this this uh, why, why would why would farmers like or peasants actually put a scarecrow because it also imitates themselves you know imitates a human form uh, themselves as farmers on the on the on the field itself and by doing that that means you are also telling whoever is there or usually the birds and like okay the farmer is here don't 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 come and eat our 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 produce here so it is also in this case where i'm also using the idea of um, uh, the scarecrow also as as a as a form of close close representation as as, as close as possible representation of 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 the peasants of the farmer on on the site in in the sense of that uh, uh, in, in a lot of times on this kind of protest or, or resistance side of, of when it comes to talking about seed resistance itself. So the, the scarecrow really, I, I don't really have a, uh, uh, when I first produce it, I don't have a one way of reading it. But of course, it does have its own intention as, as, a, as a human form, as an as a, uh, element of scaring. Uh, but, you know, I, I always like to keep it open and let people read it because it's also very different uh, different way of looking at it is so i guess um what i have in the installation you literally just see them um, you know wearing just normal clothes you know typical clothes that um, farmers or peasants are wearing but uh, in this uh, in this presentation at, at substation early last year uh, you literally see this scarecrow in the form of uh, wearing a military uniform itself 
and and again here i am using the analogy of uh, you know the military presence in in uh, rice rice fields uh, and in this case quite prevalent throughout southeast asia uh, in, you can see them actually in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and also in Myanmar itself. So this is something that was quite, uh, quite different. Uh, of course, this is more specific towards the, the showcase uh, early last year in, in substation. You know, what, whatever I have uh, currently at the, at the Bidot Library itself is, is a little bit different. Uh, you know, maybe a change of attire, it also really changed the context uh, entirely. Um, no, I wanted to maybe before moving on to talking about the substation and um, mm. maybe also some of your other previous presentations, mm -hmm. talk about perhaps how you um, were also thinking about the banners, right, that yep. the scarecrows were holding up um, yep, with yep. seeding sovereignty. And yep. I think in particular, something that, you know, we've heard with, um, with a couple of people who visited the libraries is that why are they like, why are the words so similar in color and tone to the backing upon which they are um, painted onto? Yeah, and if yeah. I could travel, Joel, to maybe go to one of the earlier slides with an image of the scarecrow <laughs> on the banner as well. From afar, actually, you can't really see what's mm. on the banners, but I guess it invites you to come up close. Could you yeah, talk a yeah. bit about, I guess, the choice to do um, protest banners in such a subtle way? Yeah. So, um. Yeah, I actually, I mean, being on site and all the sitters have been telling me, feed, giving me feedback saying everybody say it's so difficult to see what I wrote, uh, but that's actually intentional as well. Uh, intentional in a way whereby I'm also very, um, I, I guess we are all quite uh, used to seeing a lot of this, um, uh, I would say uh, a lot of this uh, protest scene, uh, images that we see, uh, not just for farmers, but for any other thing around the world itself. They often, very often, you know, just uh, start, you know, very jarring letters like so they use like oh very bright colors or just pure black on what uh, black on white or black on cardboard. So in a way, all these slogans are kind of very in your face. You often see it very very clearly, and I, I guess this is also where I want it to be a little bit different. Uh, different not in the sense that because I want it to be um, uh, or because it's a different topic, but also the idea of how. Uh, I want the audience to receive it. Yes, the I actually love that, you know, the feedback of people struggling to read them. I have to oh, they go up close to actually read them because that's my intention also. Very often, I find that a lot of such things is that uh, when people see such protest sites, you know, people who do not care, they will see it and then they was like, oh, okay, it's just something that's going on, like whatever, you know, I'm not going to care and then just move away. Um, and, and I guess by using, you know, painting white on white, uh, brown on brown uh, in a way from far maybe it looks really like hey, what is written there is like it's blank is it supposed to be blank but actually if you go up close to it you actually realize that there's certain lighting you actually see that the words are quite uh, you can actually read the words itself and that is also where I want to use this strategy to, to really force people to, to go and look at what these uh, slogans are because these slogans are really the voices of what these peasants are, are struggling with, are sharing. And they and by by putting making them kind of same tone on same tone, I'm forcing the audience to really go up close to see it rather than in a very typical way by, oh, okay, this is just a, another protest site, or these are the words, and then they just move away. And, and this is also a time I think I think um uh, in, in where where this where this installation is situated, which is right at the doorstep of the library, where you know there's a lot of heavy human traffic as well. People come and go. You know they don't really have time in that sense. And it's also the time where I hope that by you know presenting such aesthetics, it can pick up their interest and hey, okay, what is this going on? And then once they go and see, then oh, okay, it's interesting that you know why 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 is that that way as well? And and. I guess there's also the other uh, intention of me saying it in the, uh, uh, presenting it in just this white on white, not just in the way of asking people to, uh, you know, coming up close to see it, to read it itself, but also I want to see it as a kind of a, a muted protest. What I mean by muted protest is also because um, a lot of times all these struggles, uh, farmers, they share about this, you know, like, oh, they're struggling so much, they, they have this issue with the seeds whatsoever. You know, you can just Google them easily. You can find thousands of uh, images or, or even reports about it. But 
do we have, have we um, as as the common people have we done much to it? Of course, I'm not ask, I'm not asking for solutions, but you know, uh, these are things that I wanted to relay. Whereby this becomes, uh, it feels like you know, very often protests become a kind of very muted protest, and and I guess the idea of using that same tone, white on white, brown on brown, is also a way to, to kind of relay that 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 um. Yeah, that mutedness, that silence, mm -hmm. the being silenced part of, of, of uh, these individuals uh, who I've worked closely with. Yeah, I think also might, it might be interesting to maybe also just briefly mention that early on while we were thinking of, you know, this work, I think we were also very conscious about the fact that we didn't want it to be a protest site, right? Mm, we wanted yeah. to bring the concerns of farmers into the context of the work but not to sensationalize them or to instrumentalize them or to weaponize them even in the context of this work. Um, they weren't sort of um, placeholders in any way, shape or form. And mm -hmm. what we wanted to do was to encourage also perhaps a more attentive, like you say, right? You really have to come up close to actually see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And hopefully by encouraging people to do so, um, they would actually be able to sit with and spend some time with actually what some of these concerns or demands on the part of the farmers are. Mm -hmm. um, instead of it being a you know very protest-like sort of site, it's actually mm -hmm. also just a site to perhaps shed some light on some of these contemporary struggles that you know mm -hmm. are existing to the day to day. Yeah. And I think that perhaps might be a good time for us to seg into you know I think thinking about some of your previous works as well, um, because as we've been talking about this, um, rice has been something that you've been working on for a while. Mm -hmm. I think you told us a little bit about, you know, the beginnings uh, during your residency in Georgia. Mm. But, you know, this is something that you've also explored at the substation and, you know, also more recently during Singapore Art Week for Present Realms. Um, mm. How do you see, you know, seeding sovereignty as a work comparing to some of these previous installations that you've did? And maybe if I could travel you all mm. to perhaps move us to a later slide where we can have a look. Yeah, this slide is mm. good. This yeah. was the presentation that you did at uh, the substation. So maybe you can tell us, I guess, a little bit more reflecting back what you yeah. see the development or the differences being. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, so this work uh, is entitled uh, uh, Withering Rice Flourishing Sovereignty. So we're really talking about the different, different aspects of, of um, uh, kind of the commonalities of of, of uh, rise in in pretty much in that region. So here I have I have I, what I tried to approach is trying to present it in a more, um, perhaps you can even say like a like a like a kind of artifact form. You know, where I was showing different different uh, individual uh, I, items that's related to rice. You know, from from some of the uh, diminishing. Um, rice harvesting tool, traditional rice harvesting tool, to even uh, again some of the uh, bank notes that we often see, you know, a lot of rice harvesting uh, view in, in the printed on the bank notes, as well as even the, uh, the, the rice deities itself, the statues of them as well. And also coming with it, uh, it's also a, a two, two video, video work, two video installation that I kind of in, uh, incorporated into it. And in there, that's also where I start to really look at some of these voices that a lot of these farmers were, were sharing, uh, more, more personal um, encounters. And, and for me, and with the use of uh, with the research of also um, archival footage as well and, and images, you know, I kind of uh, mix and match and kind of edited a, a kind of short, short video clip, uh, two short video clips to create the, the work itself uh, to really speak a little bit from, uh, uh, from, from the perspective of a uh, not say I will not say I I'm speaking for them, but rather I am uh, trying to speak as close as possible to, to them. You know, uh, resonating whatever they have been sharing. So so these are different different components and elements. Uh, so I think can go next. Uh, yeah. So over here you also see the different uh common things that you have. You know, from again uh, the ASEAN flag itself. The ASEAN flag is actually a, a, a shift of rice bound together. So in a way, the idea of regionalism in, in, in where we are today, ASEAN, is already dictated by rice. There's something that is very prevalent that we do not know. And, and these are the different uh, emblems itself. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So and then of course, there are other parts where you, know, you have all these different uh, 
tones and, and you really also have all these different uh, ideas of historical past where you know um, political leaders are, have been using rice as a soft power tool during the Cold War period as well. So I would say uh, this, this presentation at Substation was really a, a kind of amalgamation of, of different parts. It is the start of, of this long-term long project where you know, over here, this is, uh, will develop into different chapters. And I guess Seeding Sovereignty is one of those chapters that start from here itself. Lah. Yeah, I can go next slide. Yeah. And also, I think I can share a little bit more also. Um, uh, so this was also something that I was, I realized, I, I mean, I, I uh, yeah, I realized the project uh, with my overseas uh, uh, partners. Uh, so this uh, with a uh, funding from, from a, a foundation, a overseas foundation. Um, and, and this particular work was actually realized in, in Myanmar, in Yangon, with Kokoya uh, Organic Farms. So these, these are my, some of my friends. And uh, you know, I, I often wanted to use the idea of you know, talking about uh, the native rice itself. So uh, due to the pandemic, I could not be there presently to, to realize this. But you know, eventually, we did a lot of a very online communication, and we realized this. And in this case, where it was really more like a rice tasting session, as you can see on the right hand side, there are all these different native rice seeds uh, and also rice, uh, cooked rice that they prepared itself. And over here is something that we wanted to, uh, I wanted to push and to ask my collaborator to also talk about the issue of what they know about rice itself. What are the history? Do, do they know what rice they are eating? And also, uh, are the rice that they are eating now same as the one that they used to have? How many of them have actually disappeared as well? And, you know, through this kind of very relational and interactive process, we actually get uh, the audience uh, to really share and, and, and share all these different uh, micro stories, personal stories, um, histories as well to about this as well. Uh, so we can next slide. Yeah. So I mean, of course, eventually there's also um, the idea of that 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 conversation, that discussion is not just purely. Uh, 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 I mean, that's the main part of it, but it also comes with the idea of you know tasting as well because it's something that I think we need to. Uh, you know, while we talk about seeds, you see, it's something that's very niche, very intangible, very uh, uh, not sensorial. We cannot, we cannot really uh, feel it, experience it only when we taste it itself. So therefore, I've always wanted to bring in the the, the element of taste to it as well. Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah. The, the next slide also. So uh, it was a concurrent project that's done both in Myanmar and in Indonesia. So this was done in West Java at uh, Sukabumi. Uh, so again, with uh, Sukolatani Muda, uh, but this one is in the satellite uh, group in Sukabumi. Uh, so we created this uh, Warong Dairy Sri. So again, using the concept of the Warong, which is something that's very common in the Indonesian uh, street food scene, literally just a push cut where you talk about it. Um, I, I was also playing on the idea of you know, how, how we use about this, this concept, this site, this, um, this, uh, this idea of this very mobile food pop-up space, you know, street food that is on an everyday basis, people go and eat it. But also to con tran uh, tr convert it into, a, into a, a space where we start talking about different things. And this is also where with my collaborators, um, I gave them a little bit more autonomy while I want to talk more about seeds itself. Um, and also because my collaborators, they are more, they are peasants themselves and they really have faced a lot of uh, um, struggles in, in agriculture. So they do also, we did have a mix of topics, you know, not just not just talking about seeds, but also talking about what are the real the real struggles on a on a on a ground level for farmers itself, which I think the issue of the middleman is a very prevalent thing. So in this case there were really uh, quite an interesting thing because um I think whenever we talk about or at least in, in um uh, at least in, in the city, uh, whenever people start talking about agriculture, you know Young people are not interested in, in them, but interestingly, this attracted a lot of uh, young young audience to to this um, to this iteration, you know, and and you know, uh, people are actually sharing about them. And in a way, I won't will not say that farming becomes more cool after this, but rather uh, they uh, the 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 youth start to learn and appreciate that oh, you know, whatever they have back in their home, uh, some of them coming from very conservative and traditional and very protected communities, they like realize that whatever they have there is very precious. So I think this is the very rewarding part. And again, I would say that this is the, 
the other half of the art in the work that is not being um that's not being being talked about so much. Yeah, maybe next next slide if there's any more. Yeah, so these are just more images of, of them and uh yeah. So and then next next slide. Uh, so with that actually and then I want to talk about my, what I did in the SAM residency last year as well. So while the uh, two early iterations was done in Yangon and also in Sukabumi, in, in uh, uh, both Myanmar and, and Indonesia respectively, I was also trying to uh, do that similarly here in Singapore itself. And so I, I also started a workshop. I mean, I collaborated with the Little Rice Company, which is a local rice company, uh, uh, yeah, local rice company that also uh, created their own hybrid hybrid rice seeds as well. And over there, we created this workshop at the uh, Sprouts Hub, uh, which is yeah, Sprouts Hub, where we were doing uh, this kind of workshop, where we were sharing a little bit more in terms of uh, what do we know about the seeds. And it was something also more on the idea of, um, perhaps I can say, passing on the knowledge itself. Uh, maybe next, next slide as well. Yeah, so, so again, conversation is a very big part. Uh, so again, and, and it's also here we start to bring in the aesthetics of uh, rice packages, uh, rice bags, our rice packages. Uh, and then I was also serving this particular, uh, what I call it, uh, the, the rice tea or rice water itself and serving them to drink as well. And because this is also where I start to ask people to start exploring and looking at hey, where are this um, uh, rice coming from actually because um, it, our rice is we often eat it but we actually do not know where is it coming from you know we do not uh, have those micro narratives like those participants in Indonesia and Myanmar where agriculture is more dominant in their respective countries than us for us it's really very very um, commodified very transactional we just buy and we consume itself uh, but I would just say that this experiment of this workshop was was quite a wasn't, wasn't that successful, I would say, which is a good thing actually, because that is also how I want to bring into uh, the next presentation, which is in present realms, uh, next slide please, where I kind of, pre uh, yeah, this is more images of what was done in the workshop at the uh, Sprouts Hub itself. Uh, next slide, sorry. So coming back, I wanted to bring into this, um, the latest uh, showcase that I did in January, uh, uh, early this year in, in present realms, so again, using the aesthetics of rice packets, you know, I kind of stitched them all together. Uh, and instead of really doing a workshop, which I find it was too, um, it was too much. First of all, it was too big a group. I could not really um, explore a, a, a probe individuals in terms of what they want. So as a result, what I did is that I, I confined it into uh, and maximum capacity of four four individuals in uh, yeah so including myself will be five to to really uh, where I start to run them through a, a what I call a rice tea ceremony where I invite all these audience to bring their own rice uh, from their home as well uh, next slide please yeah so in 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 this case you can see these are the several uh, props that I've actually gathered where I wanted the people to bring in their own rice to um, you know start. Uh, grinding them and then in that process I also ask them oh actually do you know where your rice is where it comes from and in that process after grinding them and kind of mix it together and also putting it in that very clay stove uh, and that clay stove where I was actually cooking the rice itself and using that water to share uh, to eventually share it with with people to consume uh, and in that process also uh, maybe next slide <coughs> excuse me and that process of, of you know preparing cooking and, and then eventually also giving it to people to consume I am again playing uh, something that is still relevant uh, still uh, I would say consistent from the overseas iterations is that the playing of uh, senses you know the senses of taste and the senses of smell I wanted people to really you know stop and start appreciating Eh, the fragrance of this rice tea, what is it? And, and but more importantly, is really the idea of asking stories from these different people. And something that I find very, very interesting is that people are, there are a lot of grandmother stories <laughs> that come from the audience. And it's, you can really see the, the matriarchal uh, society, uh, matriarchal side of, of cooking of, or, or in that sense. So uh, yeah, next slide, please. 
Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so that was the idea of the present realms itself and how uh, I was again using the capacity of, oh, sorry, go back to the previous slide. Yeah, I was using the idea of, uh, you know, a, a very conducive, a very small, uh, small capacity and inviting people to really share uh, what, what they know about their own uh, rice rice uh what the rice they come uh, what, what rice they are consuming where they are from and again using the rice packets also as a way to probe into a little bit more on the um you know where where rice or our rice in singapore comes from and how many of those are actually native uh, rice and non-native rice you know obviously most of them are uh hybrid already hybrid seeds and and non-native seeds and and this is where i think uh, seeding sovereignty comes into filling that gap of talking about the idea of the seed issue itself. Yeah, mm. yeah I think, I mean, I'm conscious also of our time. Yeah. I mean, I think in many ways, I'm sure many of us could also stay and, you know, really talk about this topic because it's so rich and there's so many layers to it. But perhaps to kind of wrap things up, I will be perhaps asking you one of the questions from the, that has come in from the audience and then yeah. wrapping things up with a final kind of conclusion sort of thought from ourselves. I think one of our audience members has asked, um, what has surprised you during your research into agriculture in Southeast Asia? And I think this is in particular um, with regard to perhaps comparing what makes farming rice unique here as compared to you know other staple crops within the region like tubers and corn and wheat. Okay. Yeah. Um. I guess. I guess perhaps. Um. One of the first thing is that. Uh. Yeah. In in at least at least here in in this island, you know we and in this cult, food culture that we are in, uh, rice is. Uh, you, we cannot. We cannot. We cannot not, not consume it, you know, compared to wheat, compared to corn and, and tubers, etc. Uh, it is something that we, yeah, we just do, we cannot have, um, we cannot not have it in, 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 in here, here in our society, uh, to the point whereby, you know, people actually grow, gets grumpy about it. And, and for me, and I, I mean, that's, that's just more of a, perhaps a personal preference, but I guess, uh, and also I think I wanted to, um, I, was, I really want to go more into the idea of the, the other aspects in terms of the cultural part as well. And uh, because it's something that we consume so much every day, you know, we tend to forget that, you know, there's so many things um, uh, that are associated with, with it that we don't take it for, that we take it for granted and we don't talk about it. I think something as basic as really going back to uh, the terminology of, of rice, you know, this is something that I find is very um, uh, very very unfair because of the language of English. We only know rice as rice, but uh, based on the language I speak, you know, which is only Mandarin and uh, Mandarin English and and some Bahasa Melayu and Indonesia. So in in Chinese, we all know that fun is cooked rice and mi is raw rice. Uh, in fact, tau mi is also like a, a, a grain itself. And then in in Malay and Indonesian, uh, we also talk about nasi as cooked rice and and um, uh, beras, beras as a raw rice itself. So already the term itself is very different. And I guess this is something that, again, that was something I took it for granted, which I did not know. And then like something, hey, I realized it's just very important. And again, coming back to the idea, the very starting point where I wanted to approach this from a more uh, spiritual point of view, where you know, I started to look at what are the different, uh, are there any deities associated with agriculture? And that's how I chance upon uh, Dewi Sri in Indonesia, and also there's also uh, Bok Sri as well, and, and also in Thailand they have uh, Mefo Sop, which is another rice deity. So again, it's already very, very associated with it, but the, in terms of other crops itself, we don't really, I mean, I, I might be wrong in that sense, but as far as my, what my research has, has covered me so far, is that I have not noticed there are really so many uh, uh, deities that are associated with certain crop itself. And it's something that, you know, uh, through my research, you also realize that uh, rice is so commonly harvested, grown, grown and harvested that, you know, you, a lot of the places use pretty much almost similar practices in growing them, harvesting them as well. So itself is, is very interesting where, where I think um, not so much of a surprise, but really more of a, a kind of revelation or, or a kind of like, wow, um, 
like realizing that you know there are so many things that we do not know about about rice itself and and so therefore i think the idea of me using rice in this sense especially and the idea of using the seed to start growing them is something i find that can resonate a lot more with with pretty much almost everyone here who or at least some whoever is uh, interacting with the with seeding sovereignty itself yeah yeah i think you know even like hearing you speak about you know all the projects that you've done previously and the different ways in which they've manifested i think all of us can get i guess just a very brief even if it's a brief glimpse uh kind of very good understanding of the fact that you know your practice is quite multifaceted in nature and it might it's also something that's quite expansive as well even though of course they are explorations around you know this single interest into rice as well um so i kind of wanted to wrap up with a question around perhaps um that in particular which would be that i suppose art making is something that many of us think as a, think of as a nuanced affair um which might be hard to maybe distill into a single kind of label or category but at the same time i think you know throughout the course of you practicing as an artist i'm sure people have used certain terms or certain descriptors to kind of um maybe try to encapsulate the work that you're doing and that might be maybe similar to how we also organize information within the context of a library as well um i guess these processes always help us to make sense of larger concepts you know by breaking them down but at the same time you can also see it unfavorably as an exercise in pigeon holing right So I was wondering, you know, I mean, coming back to seeding sovereignty again, and maybe using that as a point of departure as well. How have you grappled with the process? How have you grappled with maybe processes of categorization, um, both within your art and around, you know, the conversations around it as well? Yeah. Um. So I would say, um, yeah, I, 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 I find that I think you already mentioned those points. You know, the the pigeon holding, the categorization. Is something um, that perhaps is easy, easier to to categorize. I think as as a as a uh, from from the psyche of human beings, you know, the the idea of knowledge. Why we have knowledge is we want to categorize it. So the idea of categorization is very common. But I guess there are already too uh, too many overlaps in in what I'm doing, and of course, this overlaps. Uh, this I this notion of overlapping in in terms of our subject matter or our practice does not only apply to me as an artist but to all different artists uh but what i would want to say is that i um perhaps i would say that I, i've always used the environment as a starting point uh where we start to question and perhaps probe into kind of larger issues of in terms of a uh, um passive passive violence or or contestations and even conflicts uh maybe even kind of responding to to certain situations with a kind of uh, nuance approach where you know the audience can decide um, what type of um, uh, responses or, or viewpoints that they want because this is um this is something that i feel that uh that that you know this is also the power of of art itself the power of art making you know the the, the power of art making is really how how uh, artwork can resonate and inspire people We, pretty much how i was inspired and also uh, impacted when i was still a, a, a student in 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 school in university where where i was literally uh, exposed to to contemporary arts you know visiting museums and i find like wow okay i didn't know art can be so powerful you know can resonate so much of this um, so i i guess over here really um what i'm the, the overlaps that is happening is is very prevalent you know people can say that oh i am a uh i don't know a, a green a environmental green artist you know i am a uh uh a, a, a resistant artist i don't know i mean there are a lot of different labels uh but i guess i cannot i cannot stop people from labeling me and i just have to uh, <laughs> excuse me um Not not say upset, but really rather acknowledge what they what they want to you know uh 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 see see me as see my practice as. But more importantly, like I say, I think that the key terms that I really want to talk about with with what my art practice is, or rather what my works have been translating, is really the idea of questioning and probing into all these larger issues of um uh, passive violence, contestations, and conflicts. Uh, and and so 
you know, I have a gesture in, in this particular art making. And I think I've shared quite a lot in terms of what seeding sovereignty is and also and some of the previous works as well, what they, uh, what they resonate or what they mean. And, and different, different works have drawn different kinds of responses. And for me, that is also, uh, I would say, the beauty of it. And, and I guess it is a, a, a easy... Yeah, just, just, all I can say is like my, my practice is a rhizome. La. Like, you know, like a rhizome is very, it's just a, I, it's very hard to untangle them, but I don't think we really need to untangle them because certain things are really uh, not, as, not as complicated, but you know, you can feel it, you can see it. It's really something that I want to say is, um, uh, yeah, something about, about that feeling, you know, is, is you cannot label or classify every single thing feelings or, or, or a kind of resonance, a kind of, um, uh, 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 yeah, that is a very nuanced thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think, you know, that's such a wonderful, but also nebulous note to kind of end off this whole entire conversation with. And I just wanted to, of course, thank you again for spending your evening with us, but thank all the attendees who are still here with us this evening for, you know, spending one hour and slightly over an hour with us. Um, mm -hmm. We've really enjoyed kind of speaking to all of you and telling you more about seeding sovereignty. Um, before we head off, I think I wanted to perhaps point everybody towards um, Haupei's ongoing project, Unbroken Rice Atlas. So if you were interested sort of in all the things that Haupei was talking about and, you know, um, seeding sovereignty as a work, of course, you can visit the installation um, at Badok Public Library. But more information about, you know, the multifarious kind of facets of Haupei's practice can actually be found um, on this particular website. And you can feel free to scan the QR code to find out more about um, this ongoing project. But I think on that note, I would like to hand the time back to Jewel and thank everybody once again for spending your evening with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haupei, for today's talk. And thank you, Joella, for moderating the session. A Date with Sam is held in conjunction with Lonely Vector Seeding Sovereignty, a roving exhibition in which Haupei presents an alternative mode of seed distribution, inviting us to think about our connection with our food sources. Do catch the exhibition at Bedok Regional Library till 31st March. Following that, it will be open at Amokyo Public Library from 2nd April to 6th June, Jurong Regional Library from 8th June to 24th July, and Tampines Regional Library from 27th July to 11th September. We hope to see you there.